Good afternoon and welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts program, Art in Context. I'm Linda Friedlander, Head of Education at the Center. Today's speaker is Yuna Huang, the Nadia Sophie Seiler Rare Book Materials Resident in the Department of Rare Books and Manuscripts at the Center, where she has gained hands-on experience working with and cataloging rare materials. Yuna received her MLIS from the University of California, Los Angeles, with a specialization in rare books, print, and visual culture, and received her BA in English Literature and Language with a concentration in book studies from Smith College. The title of Yuna's talk today is Commonplace Book. Please note that this program will be recorded your camera and sound are muted and will remain so through the program. We will be using the Q&A feature on your navigation bar to gather some questions and attempt to answer them at the end of the program. But please feel free to submit questions anytime. If you need closed captioning, a live transcript is available by clicking on the icon on your toolbar. Yale University acknowledges that the indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Western Pequot, Shattucot, Gold Hill Pogaset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking people have stewarded through generations, the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect these people and nations and this land. Yuna? Um, okay, uh, thank you for that really lovely introduction and thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, as Linda mentioned, my name is Yuna Huang and for the past year, I've had the privilege of being the Nadia Sophie Seiler Rare Materials Resident at the Yale Center for British Art in the Rare Books and Manuscripts Department. And I've been contributing to the cataloging efforts of the department under Francis Lapka's very kind and super patient guidance, making sure I don't completely disappear into too many rabbit holes or run myself into the ground digging in through the weeds of WAMI. Um, this residency was originally supposed to be a nine month term position, but I was fortunate enough to have my position extended by a few months in light of the pandemic so I could have a chance to actually get inside this really wonderful building and work on site instead of being tethered to Zoom from a cold, lonely corner of my apartment. Um, this residency made possible by the generosity of the Nadia Sophie Seiler Memorial Fund is designed to give early career library professionals the opportunity to gain hands-on experience cataloging rare materials and to learn about the different aspects of special collections librarianship in celebration of Nadia's passion and expertise for rare materials and cataloging, and to foster that same passion and expertise in emerging special collections professionals. And I think we've done a pretty solid job checking off all those boxes, plus a lot more on top of it too. In the time I've been here, I've gotten to participate in discussions on critical cataloging at the center and join the Reparative Archival Description Working Group under the Yale University Library System. And on top of all the cataloging, I've been a part of the center's DEAI community group, and I've helped out with instruction and library orientation sessions and contributed to creating social media content for the rare books department too. I've also learned how to do name authority work, which is in a roundabout way where my focus for this presentation today comes from in recognizing the sparse representation of women in the historical record, in other words, cultural or historical collections, much like many other areas of history and historical study. Now, name authority files like this one here are records maintained by the Library of Congress that specify an established form of a name to be used in library catalog records so that the name is recorded consistently across catalogs and collections and also differentiated from other individuals with the same name. And these records include alternate forms of names as well as sources with biographical information, but most importantly, a citation for the work for which the heading is being established. 
In other words, name authority files can only be created when the name is specified as a contributor to a work being cataloged, which can make it quite difficult to improve representation in the Library of Congress name authority files of women who are involved in various aspects of the historical book trade, since so many of them that were active in the book trade were overshadowed or overwritten by their male relatives, usually their husbands, with much of this issue of representation or a lack thereof being a consequence of contemporary patriarchal values in what information was recorded and of subsequent decisions in what was preserved and what was collected which is what makes extant commonplace books compiled by women so interesting as evidence of these women's lives and their relationships with reading, writing, and just books in general, especially when commonplace books were originally produced in sites that excluded women, primarily sites for humanist education. But what exactly is a commonplace book? Well, it depends on who you ask and where you look for a definition. The Dictionary of English Manuscript Terminology defines a commonplace book in its original form as a manuscript book in which quotations or passages from reading matter, precepts, proverbs, and aphorisms, useful rhetorical figures or exemplary phrasing, words and ideas or other notes and memoranda are entered for ready reference under general subject headings, these headings often having been systematically written in advance of the main entries. And a lot of the academic scholarship on the topic of commonplace books relies on a similar definition. For example, the scholar Adam Smith describes the commonplace book in its purest or more classic form presents a series of thematic headings under which aphorisms are distributed, gathered from reading or more rarely from conversation and deemed in some way useful or exemplary. This item from the Joshua Reynolds collection here at the center fits into the strict definition of a commonplace book with prescribed headings like one section for excerpts of Shakespeare and another for Italian pro proverbs. And as you can imagine, commonplace books like this one here with a high degree of organization and ones with even stricter organization required a lot of advanced planning, a lot of labor and a lot of upkeep. So a number of commonplace books from this time period ended up declining an organization and apparent commitment, or even being abandoned completely with pages towards the back of the volume being left blank or almost blank like you see here. In fact, so many commonplace books didn't really adhere to these strict definitions of a commonplace book and often blurred into other textual forms. Extant commonplace books rarely conform to such neat templates commonplace books are overwhelmingly messier texts, messier in terms of the kinds of inclusions they present, everything from lines of Ovid to recipes to cure an ailing horse, and in terms of their material form. And even if they started with the intentions of following a defined organizational scheme with thematic headings under which passages were copied, they were not always precisely called commonplace books over the centuries. To complicate matters, these collections have traveled through the centuries under various names and aliases, even those that satisfy the strictest definition of a commonplace book. Notebooks, miscellanies, pocketbooks, memoranda books, diaries, thesaurus, um, anthologies, albums, scrapbooks, sylvae, table books, florilegia, and ones vademecum. The commonplace book in theory was quite incongruous with the actual commonplace book in practice, so much so that where commonplace books end and where other textual forms begin is often difficult to discern. And much to the complaint of many scholars, this almost nebulous quality of what constitutes a commonplace book is apparent in how these items are categorized in library collections. AAT or the Art and Architecture Thesaurus from the Getty Research Institute defines commonplace books as books in which noteworthy literary passages, cogent quotations, poems, comments, recipes, prescriptions, and other miscellaneous document types are written. The RBMS controlled vocabularies for genre terms defines commonplace books as personal notebooks in which the owner has copied passages of interest or written his or own compositions. And 
This definition doesn't even distinguish between manuscript and printed commonplace books and leaves flexibility for the inclusion of the owner's original writings. Cataloging decisions on whether to categorize something as a commonplace book or not based on these looser definitions have led to criticisms that the term commonplace book is used almost haphazardly in library catalogs as a catch-all term to describe any sort of manuscript of a miscellaneous character with varied content, or that it's applied with imprecise inaccuracy to hinder scholarly work in identifying a quote-unquote true commonplace book, as pesky catalogers tend to do with their very nefarious tendencies. Um, but with the reality of commonplace books really falling quite short of the theoretical ideal that they could have been, there would be very few items that a collection could categorize as a commonplace book if catalogers were to follow stricter definitions. And it would be disingenuous to contemporary considerations of commonplace books as manuscript commonplace books were not generically distinguished from albums or scrapbooks in the 19th century nor did they replace the former. And this sort of a hybrid commonplace book, scrapbook, album became, became widespread practice as literacy and access to texts increased. This item that we cataloged as a commonplace book would probably not meet the threshold for the high degree of organization needed to qualify as a commonplace book in the strictest sense but it's fairly representative of the kind of actual commonplacing that took place in practice. This commonplace book was compiled by Harriet Sargent and contains a collection of poems, essays, epistles, quotes, and excerpts from plays, novels, and newspaper articles. Many of the entries are accompanied by an engraving that's been pasted into the volume oftentimes from the printed volume that the text was copied from. And there are watercolor drawings of flowers throughout the volume as well. Many of the entries are prefaced with titles of the text that was copied, similar to the headings that one would ideally find in a commonplace book. There's a noticeable degree of organization and care in the compilation of this volume, particularly with the list of plates that can be found at the front, indicating a level of care that was put into not just the copying of text, but also selecting and collecting the content compiled into the book that resembles the spirit of a dedicated commonplace book. But what distances this item from the strictest definition of a commonplace book is not its organization or lack of thematic headings per se, but rather the fact that much of what is copied in the volume are copies of complete texts, entire poems and essays, and not excerpts or passages extracted from a longer work or short aphorisms collected into a single page. And even with the looser definitions for cataloging purposes, this item kind of blurs into the territory of a format called a miscellany which usually contains complete text copied into the volume and is defined in AAT as compilations of separate articles, treaties, studies, or literary compositions of various kind brought together into one volume. Similarly, this volume in the collection that was likely compiled by an individual named Catherine Muriel also bleeds into a different textual form. It contains lines of verse, excerpts of poems and prose, epitaphs, epigrams, and descriptive notes on architectural subjects and historical figures. It also reflects some degree of organization with many entries also being prefaced with a title or heading of some sort and thematic headings um, and thematic threads like flowers, art, and religion being present throughout the volume. However, as you get further into the volume, Many of the entries are written, dated, and signed in different hands, likely that of Catherine's friends and acquaintances, with some of the entries being letters addressed to her. Some of the illustrative content also includes drawings signed by others, and so the item leans a little bit into the category of an album amicorum, also known as an autograph book or a book of friends that was usually compiled by someone during their travels and defined in AAT as bound collections of autographs, writings, paintings, and drawings collected by the owner from his or her friends and acquaintances. 
But the beauty of cataloging is that we can apply more than one form genre term to categorize items and that they don't have to be mutually exclusive. And to apply more than one form genre term would be more authentic to the way in which commonplace books and the practice of commonplacing was considered by the general public of the 19th century. The Catherine Muriel commonplace book even includes an introductory entry that reads, should any friend e'er cast a look within this album or scrapbook to pass a fleeting hour, I trust they will amusement find some pleasing verse by friends combined or landscape lover, indicating she thought of her book as an album or scrapbook, had planned from the beginning to collect entries from others and compiled the volume with potential readers or an audience in mind, when commonplace books were in their strictest sense compiled for the owner's easy reference and to aid in their recollection of texts. But even with the available wiggle room under the definitions used in cataloging, this item here gave us a bit of pause in cataloging it as a commonplace book. It contains a collection of epitaphs, elegies, hymns, excerpts from literary works, sonnets, lines of verse, entire poems, and quotations. Many of the entries are not accompanied by a heading or title, and entries are actually written in several different hands, most of them signed or initialed at the bottom, suggesting the volume was compiled by multiple people, almost like an album amicorum, except the volume itself doesn't seem to have a clearly discernible owner. Based on the names of contributors, the volume seems to have been compiled by primarily members of the Irby family, with Georgina Albina Irby, Rachel Emily Irby, Frances Matilda Irby, and Charlotte Isabella Irby being the most frequent contributors. And because the item still aligns with the definition in AAT, which doesn't specify any conditions of ownership for an item to qualify as a commonplace book, we decided to catalog this item categorized as both a commonplace book and an album amicorum, despite how unconventional it may be in form, because it's more like a commonplace book than not, with the same justification applying in its categorization as an album amicorum. Additionally, this record ultimately ended up having a really brief 545 biographical note at the top here that many of the contributors to the volume appear to be related to George Irby, the third Baron Boston, some of them possibly being his children. Catalog records for the previous two commonplace books by Harriet and Catherine did not include a biographical note at all because the two volumes didn't provide any biographical information to be able to confidently identify who they were beyond their names, as is often the case with manuscript items that aren't attributed to a prominent figure. Fortunately, this last commonplace book I want to share today was compiled by a woman named Susan Hammond who was kind enough to share that she was from Jersey. Um, this volume contains epitaphs, epigrams, hymns, various excerpts of verse and prose, as well as musical texts. So the content is quite varied like the others. What's particularly interesting about this commonplace book is that it is organized in a way that mimics the form of a printed book. With its equivalent of a title page at the front, and its use of headings and vignettes and the formatting of its full page drawings to imitate plate illustrations. But with the information that she was from Jersey, we were able to find a record of her baptism in 1791 and her marriage in 1822. And from those records, we were able to identify her parents and her husband. Um, but what we could write in the biographical note was still limited by what information about her was preserved and made available. Even in writing the actual 545 field, we were cautious in not formulating the biographical note in a way that framed her strictly according to her relationship to a male figure in her life. So not as just someone's daughter and someone's wife. And we wrote the field to center her as an active subject, or we tried our best to do so. While not equivalent to establishing a Library of Congress name authority file for her, I'd like to think that creating a 545 field biographical note for Susan Hammond in a way adds this catalog record to her collective biography, or so to say the larger body of records available out in the world about her life. 
And the catalog records for these commonplace books, even without a biographical note, make the commonplace books themselves accessible to the public in a way serving as a record or evidence of these women's lives and their engagement with texts, with reading and with writing as something that they created, which compared to a document like a census record or a marriage certificate with information about them that was drafted by someone else is a much more concrete remnant of their lives. To exclude these commonplace books for the sake of adhering to the strictest definition of a commonplace book would be a disservice to our modern understanding and considerations of manuscript collections of women's engagement with reading and writing and of how different textual formats overlap and diverge and especially of how commonplacing was actually practiced over time. So to conclude my presentation and my residency here, I've learned in the time I've been here that despite the layers and layers and layers of standards and rules to follow while cataloging an item, there's more than one way to catalog something, especially a commonplace book. And there isn't always an exact correct answer unless it's about punctuation. And this fluidity offers opportunities to be deliberate in not just how you catalog, but also in what you decide to catalog. And by extension, opportunities to contribute to more inclusive and multifaceted scholarship as indirectly that may be. Now, recognizing that directions from your supervisor will take priority in practice um, over lofty idealistic sentiments. I hope to carry this mindset and sense of initiative with me in my future cataloging endeavors and scholarly pursuits. Um, I'm so grateful to have had the chance to work here at the center with so many people who have been so kind and willing to share their expertise with me. And I'm so thankful to have had this opportunity as the major first step of my professional journey. I had actually seen the posting for the Siler resident years ago when I had just decided to pursue special collections librarianship as a career and apply to MLIS programs because I was interested in cataloging rare materials. Um, so to have gone through this experience is absolutely surreal. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Yuna. I can't seem to get my uh, video up, but um, thank you for that very clear and uh, thank you um, for that very clear and concise definition of what a commonplace book is uh, and uh, the cataloging that goes into it to make these things available to more and more audiences. Um, let me just uh, review some of the questions that we got. Um, did these books come in volumes? Did the number of pages in an empty book determine the end or could extra pages be added over and over again? Um, well, usually what most people would do is they would purchase a blank book as it was sold. Um, and they would just write in whatever content they did. So books were sold as blank volumes, like you would see like as sketchbooks or blank notebooks at Barnes and Nobles that they sell in that one corner of the store. Um, as for determining the end, if that individual was like as dedicated um, to really make the most out of their commonplace book, some people would fill out to the very last page available. Um, some of the really intense ones I've seen even kind of uh, extend out into the end pages and the covers and there's writing all over, but a lot of commonplace books with how much um, effort that they take um, leaves quite a bit of blank pages at the end. Um, you know, like most people tend to do with um, very committed projects. Um, and for extra pages being added over and over again, um, there are definitely some where the owner has like pasted in pages or slipped in loose leaf pages um, with more and more content, but with the binding of a volume, there is a limit to how much you could squeeze in. So um, most people would either abandon that book with blank pages or like move on to a new uh, blank volume once they were done with that one. Thank you. 
What is the major source for most of these books that you are cataloging? Where does the Yale Center for British Art go to find them or other, other places, other institutions? Um, I haven't been able to gain a ton of experience in how acquisitions work in this field, but from my understanding, uh, the center has quite a number of antiquarian booksellers that they're in frequent contact with. There are antiquarian book fairs um, and like really big events where these kinds of rare materials are often sold. Um, and that's usually where we get them. Um, it's not like an art gallery, like Christie's or something. Um, uh, although there are some that are sold through auction processes, I would see. I would think, um, uh, and then there are quite a few that were donated to the collection from personal collections, um, things that people have kept like from family or just from uh, a used bookstore that they found a commonplace book or small treasures that they happened to run across. Thank you. Another question. Are these materials centralized someplace? Uh, and I'm assuming um, the meaning is that there's lots of other places that are accumulating these kinds of objects. So if somebody was to go to research them, is there a centralized uh, repository or catalog um, where somebody can find multiple places with these, re these references? Um, as far as I know, there isn't um, like a national database uh, where institutions are coordinating with each other to keep track of where commonplace books are. Because a lot of the times um, they're compiled just by normal everyday people, not super famous people. Um, and most collections have quite a number of them. A lot of them are unattributed, so it'll be quite difficult to maintain a database of some sort like that. Um, usually you can, I, you can locate commonplace books at individual repositories, just searching their catalog with the term commonplace book. Um, but if you don't want to do that, you can also reach out to your local cataloger or librarian, which I'm 100% sure would be happy to help you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for one last question. Uh, this is from Deborah Leslie. Thank you, Yuna. It's good to see Nadia's legacy carried on so capably and enthusiastically. Question, have you considered naming these hybrid-like compilations miscellanies instead of commonplace books? Would that avoid semantic conflict with scholars who care deeply about the categorization of such materials? Um, for me personally, in deciding to prioritize identifying these items as commonplace books rather than miscellanies, um, my thought was that scholars involved in commonplace books and the act of compiling various texts into one volume would be interested in finding these items. So to make them accessible is why I decided to categorize them as commonplace books. Um, some of them I did uh, add form genre term of miscellanies because they also lean into that category as well. But with miscellanies, I think the emphasis is in that miscellanies usually have complete texts that were copied in whereas commonplace books, the focus is on excerpts or short lines. Um, and the volumes that I cataloged were more leaning towards the side of shorter passages and excerpts than full on complete longer texts. Um, as for scholars who cared deeply about the categorization of some such materials, I think with the ambiguity of these items, you know, not necessarily falling into either so perfectly, I think there'll still be some criticisms either way we go, um, which is why we decided to do 
multiple form genre terms for a lot of these items. Um, but I think there is, I did also notice while doing my research that there is increasing shifts in being more open about how commonplace books are defined um, and how the study of these items can be expanded. So I don't think there's a clear way to avoid semantic conflict at all, but um, having both will definitely help in finding them. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, we, uh, I'd also like everybody to know that Yuna is departing this week um, to start a new position uh, in the Harvard College Library as their librarian for undergraduate support. Um, please join me in wishing Yuna well. Um, uh, no grass grows under her feet. Um, and um, you were a delight uh, and we were so happy and lucky to have you with us for the past year. So thank you and good luck. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed my time here. Good. Uh, I just want to um, mention to our audience that our next Art in Context will be Tuesday, November 30th at 1230 p.m. Mark Aronson, uh, the Deputy Director and Chief Painting Conservator, will be talking about the painting techniques of Sir Joshua Reynolds. Thank you for joining us and hope to see you soon.